one of the consequences of G Einstein's theory of general relativity is that gravitational fields affect time. That's an extraordinary concept, it's very difficult to visualize. And when I first learned about it, um, I found it totally incredible. You need awfully good clocks to do this, and the clocks are atomic clocks. Atomic clocks were first proposed by I. I. Rabi about 1944. And it's really very interesting that when he first proposed it, he said that you might be able to make a clock which is good enough to see the effect of gravity on time. So this was a motivating factor in the development of atomic clocks from the very beginning. Without going into the history of atomic clocks, um, which got developed over the years and have gotten better and better and better, I'll just say that the clocks are now good enough to see that and actually to measure it with quite high precision. One of the interesting things is that when we first set out to make these atomic clocks, our goals were about the least practical you can think of. Nothing is less useful than uh, general relativity. But it turns out it is very useful because it was the development of these clocks which enabled the global positioning system. So there was this rather unexpected byproduct of this quest to understand general relativity. It turns out that in the global positioning system, not only can you detect the effect of gravity on time, you've got to take it into account or it just wouldn't work. From being a rather abstract idea that you'd like to somehow witness, it becomes a very urgent thing for the conduct of human affairs. So this is a rather interesting evolution. Now the clocks have been evolving for over 50 years now. And in the past 10 years, they've gotten extremely good. There's a new generation of atomic clocks which can measure <clears throat> the effect of gravity on time to very, very high precision. In fact, too high. And the reason is this. The rate at which time flows depends on the gravitational field. Now, the effect of the gravitational field uh, of the Earth on time, the total effect is not huge. It's about uh, one part in 10 to the 12th, comparing a clock on the Earth into totally free space, very far from the Earth. But um, the modern clocks are good to the, well have reached uh, better than one part in 10 to the 17th. If you raise a clock by one centimeter, it changes time by about one part in 10 to the 18th. Okay? So the clocks are good enough to see changes in height. The problem is that what do you mean by height? Height from where? There's a th a theoretical surface of the Earth, the geoid, where the gravitational field is constant over the geoid, and you'd like to measure from that. But it's very difficult to locate the geoid. And in fact, the geoid itself is fluctuating around because the shape of the Earth is changing. And uh, the, the distribution of mass on the Earth changes as water moves around and the climates change. So the geoid is kind of fluctuating. This brings up the question of what do you mean by time? You could define one spot on the Earth as the standard spot you're going to measure from, and that will be your standard time. But that isn't really very satisfactory from a physical point of view. You could talk about a clock which is so far removed from the Earth that you're not affected by the gravitational fluctuations of the Earth, and think of a hypothetical clock right there. But that's really not much better because, in fact, we have gravitational fields not due to the Earth, but due to the other planets, the sun, the solar system, in fact, the whole universe. You have to come back and think just what you mean by time. And the fact is, because of the effect of gravity on time, the idea of an ideal clock by itself is non-physical. You have to include gravitational fields in your concept of time. No one knows how to do this really in a practical fashion right now. But beyond that is this very provocative question. What do you mean by time if time is affected by gravity? If gravity, of course, is generated by mass, and there's always mass around. So we go back to this question that I.I. I. Robbie raised when he first proposed atomic clocks, 
this pursuit of seeing the effect of gravity on time, it's been very fruitful, not only in resulting in the general positioning system, the global positioning system, but um, in raising these new provocative questions about what we really mean when we talk about time. What Robbie was proposing by way of an atomic clock was to put to use a technique he had developed just about seven or eight years before then, and for which he got the Nobel Prize in 1944, which is called molecular beam magnetic resonance. This is a technique for measuring spectral levels in atoms and molecules which are not at optical frequencies, but are, in this case, at microwave frequencies. He pointed out that if you can see these transitions at microwave frequencies, you could lock the oscillator. You could just keep tuning the oscillator so it sits on this transition. In that case, you have an oscillator or a frequency standard which is as stable as the atom itself. That's the principle of the atomic clock. Realizing the atomic clock in, involved developing new atomic techniques. It involved electronics and such. But the first clock was actually demonstrated about 1954 using the cesium atom. It was called the cesium beam atomic clock. And for the next 50 years, those clocks got better and better. The first ones were good to about one part in 10 to the 10th. Now, that's a you know, 10 billion, which generally would be considered very, very accurate. But in the clock world, that was just where they were beginning. And over the decades, the cesium beam clock was refined, got better and better, till right now it's good to about one part in 10 to the 16th. Beyond that, one needed new types of atomic clocks which became possible with the development of a number of techniques. First of all, with the laser itself, which is absolutely essential for this. Um, and with the laser, you can generate frequencies which are not in the microwave regime, but the optical frequencies. And you could lock a laser to uh, atoms at these optical frequencies. The problem is, for a clock, you need not only something which goes periodic in time over and over again very fast, you need to be able to count the ticks. And about 10 years ago, uh, Jan Hall and Ted Hench invented a method for doing this. It's called the optical frequency comb. It was a truly revolutionary method, and it allows you to make a clock which ticks at uh, you know, 10, 10 to the 14th times a second. You know, uh, practically a, a, a million billion times a second and, and stabilize your clocks at these frequencies. And this has been a breakthrough which is now leading to these very new high precision clocks. In a demonstration just a few years ago uh, at NIST in Boulder where they're the leaders in these clocks, they actually took two atomic clocks and they put one on a desk and another one on the floor and, and then they jacked up the one on the floor, and you could see the difference in time as the clock was raised one foot. So that's a, that's a rather direct demonstration that gravity really does affect time. But it also demonstrates that we're at this level where we need to worry about what gravity itself is doing. You can compare the gravitational fields that far apart pretty well with pendulums and things. But if you try to compare a gravitational field here with another one uh, a few kilometers away to that precision, you're really stuck. So that's where we've gotten time. It's what I call, which is time too good to be true. Because at this level of precision, the concept of time is corrupted by the Earth. There is a major technical question right now. One would like to be able to compare these clocks at very large distances and comparing clocks, transferring time at the precisions of parts into the 10 to the 17th or 18th is very, very difficult. It can be done using optical fibers, but you have to have then direct connections between the different laboratories. And one would like to be able to connect them not only between different laboratories nearby, but uh, on different continents too. So this question of time transfer is one which a lot of people are working on. Uh, I'm sure that it will be solved at some point because there's no law of physics which says that you can't do it, but it, it is a tough problem. If you could do that, 
it would be useful for all sorts of things, for uh, quantum computation if you want at ultra high frequencies, um, for just transferring information. I mean, right now we use the global positioning system for synchronizing our clocks around the world, but with much better clocks, you'd like a, a better synchronizing system. So there are many practical applications for which we could use this higher quality time. Probably one which you can use it for would be the global positioning system, which is already so good. It's difficult to have a global positioning system which would locate people's position within the wavelength of light. Um, it'd be sort of a nice ideal, but no one quite knows how to do that. But if you had a global positioning system working at optical frequencies, then you could do that. One, not a GPS, which operates at optical frequencies, but there are proposals for making a laser interferometer to de detect gravitational waves. There's one on Earth in this country, in the United States, there's the LIGO project does that. There are proposals for putting satellites in space very far from each other and from the Earth and tracking their positions to look for gravitational waves. For that, you like this type of precision, and the, the, we, we have that precision. Uh, we don't have the satellites in orbit. It's an expensive project, and a lot of people would like to do it, but that's, for the present, rather visionary.